I had intended it, or had visualized it as a novella, because I was working on another novel, and then I had this idea, I thought, well, I can write it kind of quickly, I'll write this novella. And then I wrote the novella and gave it to some people to read, and one person thought that it was maybe only halfway finished. And I, I didn't like that answer, um, but it turned out to be true. So I, I, I wrote the rest of it. And so in that case, I, I had more of a sense of that first part. And then I knew what was gonna happen next once I got back to the writing. Um, and then after that, you know, it, it kind of fell into place after that. Author and book designer Robert Wexler is our guest this time on the Plutopia podcast. We discuss his early career, his work in book design, and his new novel, The Silverberg Business. Hey, hey, welcome everybody to another episode of the Plutopia News Network's podcast. And our guest today is Robert Freeman Wexler, who is an author of surreal fiction and fantasy. His latest book, is a novel called The Silverberg Business, which I have just read and which I really enjoyed. It's a page turner, uh, published by Small Beer Press. Is there a big beer press? Hmm. No. no. Uh, and the previous books Robert's written include a short story collection called Undiscovered Territories, a novel called The Painting in the City, another one called Circus of the Grand Design, which I have queued up to read. Uh, and Robert lives in Yellow Springs, Ohio, and uh, used to live in Texas, or is originally from Texas. So how did you get from Texas to Ohio, Robert? Um, via New York. <laughs> uh, I moved from Austin to New York City in 95, was there about four years, then a year in Western Massachusetts, and then uh, Yellow Springs. Just kind of bouncing around. Yeah. So what what brought you to Yellow Springs? Why did you finally land there? I came to visit friends, and they introduced me to somebody, and we're still together. So. Oh, cool. That's great. I've always wanted to visit Ohio. I never have. Yeah. Is um, It seems like there... No, I'm thinking about Iowa. There was a, a school for writers in Iowa. Is that correct? Yeah, that's Iowa. Yeah. Iowa Writers Workshop. It's, yeah. So I know that um, aside from being a writer, you've done some, uh, you have some experience with book design and you and I originally met working for a high-end typesetter here in Austin many years ago. And one of the things I was there for was to learn more about how books and periodicals are put together and how typography works. And I guess... I assume you were there kind of for the same reason. Is that correct? Yeah, that and, and to pay rent. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. Yet another thing. Yeah. We had to make money. I, th I recall that's the first place I ever worked that I actually got a Christmas bonus. Yeah. I was pretty excited about that. Yeah. So uh, you have gone on to do some some work in book design. How did sort of how did that evolve? And and. Uh, What's the state of that now? It seems that uh, with the technologies we have, book design has sort of, uh, um, I don't know quite how to put it. Uh, it's not, it's, when you design a book, you have to keep in mind that it's also liable to be read in electronic versions and so yeah. forth. And I just sort of wonder what considerations you have to make for that. I think not, not exactly any because it's a separate process. So, I mean, there's things, I mean, so far for me anyway, I've only, the only things I've converted to eBooks are just straightforward text. Um, but because what you do in an eBook is more limited design wise, it's not really, 
like at the conversion of whatever from the print to EPUB, whatever, it just, it's sort of a generic look. So yeah. And there are things you can do if you're more experienced with it than I am. I, I'm not that interested in ebooks. I know there's more, like you can do art books as ebooks, but I mean, the basic reflowable ebook format um, isn't something that's, you know, has, has much uh, you can design about it. Which you is know, because also the person, you know, it's set up so that whoever is reading it with their device, they can change the typeface and, you know, whatever. Exactly. So it's, it has to be kind of generic to support that. Well, where hard copy physical books are concerned, I know that uh, after the so-called desktop publishing revolution, um, there was a move away from expensive high-end typography. And I know I have worked with publishers who would just hand you a template and you just drop your text into the template and they would print it from that. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems that there may have been a loss of quality in general in books, but are there still people who are doing the really high end stuff, spending yeah. a lot of money on book production? I think so. I mean, university presses still want their books to be well designed. And I mean, they're all, I guess, subsidized anyway by their colleges that yeah. know where they are, et cetera. So, and I mean, some of the big publishers, it seems like, especially cover design, they're still really into, you know, it's a, their covers are still a selling point too. So that's different. And their interiors, a lot of them still look good, you know, and some, some don't as much. I mean, <clears throat> no standards aren't what they used to be, I guess. And, yeah, exactly. But, and well, I, I hear people. There's some, there's some oh, websites like I guess for self-publishing where it basically says upload your text file and then they spit out a designed book. And I, I have no idea what those look like, but they're not designed by a person, obviously. Yeah, yeah, it's algorithmic all the way. Yeah. So um, I lost track of what I was gonna ask a minute ago, but, um, oh, I remember. It, I keep hearing that nobody's reading books anymore and that there's no market for books. And then I go to the bookstore and I see tons of books everywhere and I see people like browsing the shelves and it doesn't seem to me that there's any loss of interest in books. What, what's your perception of that? Yeah, it's the same. It seems like, you know, like when I was in Austin and I came I didn't have time to look around um, book people the day of the reading, but then when I came back, I, you know, I went and I browsed and there were just people everywhere browsing and, and browsing books and not just all of the other, you know, knickknacks and things that they have there. Yeah, it's been true of every bookstore I've been in. They're always packed. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I think it's a myth. It's probably yeah. a myth that nobody's reading books. Uh, I, and I know that you've been writing books and I can recall from when we met many years ago that you had an aspiration then to, to become a writer. Were you writing then in the same vein you are now? Pretty much. I mean, the circus of the grand design that ended up being it was my, my first novel that was published. It was my second book, technically, because I had a novella published before that. Um, but I actually started it, I mean, back when I knew you at GNS. So it just took a long time to finish, rewrite, you know, eventually get published, et cetera. But I, there actually are some character names in there or characters even sort of based on people we worked with. Oh, interesting. Possibly. Can't wait to read that one. Yeah. <laughs> so your latest book, um, The Silverberg Business, was just released, and you've been touring uh, behind that book. How's your book tour been going? 
No, it's good. It's it's been it's mostly done. I'm doing another reading in two and a half weeks or so, but in town here, so it's not much of a. I, I get to walk down the street to the library, so. Uh, and my my sense of the book is that you put a lot of effort into it. How long did it take you to write it? Um, about three years ish. Um, I had meant to look this up because I, I found a, a, an old notebook from about when I finished, which was 2015, like at the end of the year. And then my memory was starting at around early 2012. So let's say three years then. So if you finished it in 2015, did it take, it took you this long to find a publisher? Yeah. Or? Yeah, I mean, there's finishing a first draft, going back through rewriting, getting other people to read it. And then it, it's always been a really long uh, process for me to find a publisher. I'm just uh, In recent years, I've read some books that uh, on the surface seem like they were actually film scripts that people were writing a book and hoping that someone to pick up the film rights, which mm -hmm. seems to happen. <laughs> a lot lately and the books just didn't seem to work as a book and maybe as a film fine but it seemed like people are using that as a way to i guess interview for getting a film yeah or it may be it's those people who don't read books that we were just talking about that they watch movies tv series etc and then they write a so their model for how something should be is um more visual or or whatever that kind of narrative and not uh, a book structure maybe yeah i think that since uh cinema first became more of a thing writers have been influenced by forms of media i know um, one of my one of the authors i liked quite a bit was malcolm lowry who wrote under the volcano and and there were passages in that that were you might say cinematic he seemed to be influenced quite a bit by movies. Mm -hmm. um, your book, um, one thing I noticed was that your style of writing was pretty spare. I guess the word you use for it, use for it is laconic. That mm -hmm. you're not you're not embellishing a lot, but it's it's sort of a very uh, austere prose. Uh, have you always written that way? No, and. The, it's more specific to that book because of <clears throat> the style and, and because, you know, my models for it were sort of the hard-boiled detective fiction, you know, so I was, you know, writing more in that style, I guess you'd call it, then. It's, still, it's, a, it's a detective story, but it's also a Western. Yeah. Uh, so it feels like you're kind of mixing genres up there a bit, which is kind of interesting. Um, did you think of it as a more of a Western or did, did that just happen to be the right era for it? A little of both. I mean, I was thinking of it more as a Western before I actually wrote it. And then to me, it's not really a Western other than the time period. You know, it's, it's more yeah. of a I guess, detective story in towns during that period where that we think of as Westerns. And then there's attributes of Westerns in it, which, you know, are unavoidable, I guess. <laughs> and I've wondered about the, I, I know I've already, uh, I've seen interviews you've given where you talked about having done quite a bit of research. I know you did put a lot of effort into the research behind the book. Um, how did you decide when you were done researching and it was time to write, or did you just kind of keep researching as you went? Some of both, um, partly because I don't necessarily know where I'm going when I start. So things will come up and I'll want to research them, like, you know, public dances or, or whatever, what, whatever they're called, not, you know, not Soirees. dance concerts, but... Um, I mean, not ballet, but, you know, dancing, you know, how did people dance? Like a square that? dance or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so things like that, you know, I'll, I'll keep 
keep researching as I go if something comes up like that. I mean, like early things, like the history of Victoria, Texas, and things in Texas, you know, I did all that early on. And by the end, I'd, you know, forgotten some of it. In <laughs> Indian Nola. You know, like, you know, like thinking about the map of Victoria, Texas from that period, streets and all that. And I got that in my head, but then towards the end, I'd sort of forgotten some of those details, which I, I knew them when I needed them, I guess you'd say. But And the characters seem to move into uh, other dimensions or other spaces that are, you know, I mean, this is a, one of the surreal aspects of the book. I guess you didn't zap yourself into another dimension to research yeah. that. I guess not. No. <laughs> was were dreams an influence on this uh yes and no i mean more like the way dreams influence surrealist art i guess is is just is trying to capture the dreaminess of a landscape or a situation or something so not my actual dreams but um dreaminess you could say yeah, and I don't want to blow a bunch of spoilers here, but yeah. um, there are some aspects of the book that are, I guess you would say, based in fantasy. And I'm thinking about um, the, the sort of sand hills or mountains and how those worked and the skulls and that sort of thing. Um, did you just sort of dream those up? I mean, kind of how does the story like this come together, especially with the fantastic elements? Um, subconsciously, I guess, because <laughs> some of that, I, I don't, I mean, the skulls, skull heads, whatever, I mean, that was easy in that I was looking at the, you know, book of John Langford's, you know, paintings, and he has these skull head images, and I thought about, you know, what kind of characters would those make? Um, you know, and other things, like how I ended up using them, I don't exactly remember, <clears throat> you know, but I- But Langford was the inspiration. And, you know, and, you know, a lot of that is, is, I've always tried to access my subconscious when I write, um, you know, free writing, that kind of thing to, you know, not be, not have my, sense of uh, whatever cluttered by thinking too much about it as I'm doing it, I guess. I was always, I was aware of Langford as a musician, but I didn't, until, until I looked at your book and saw that your references to Langford, mm -hmm. I didn't realize that he was making this art. How did you discover Langford's art? Originally, I think I was reading the No Depression magazine, which was, you know, the whatever, alt country stuff. And there were ads for his art shows at Yard Dog in Austin. Oh. And that was that was the first that I realized that he made, you know, visual art. And then um, you know, saw some online here and there. And it was eventually it was it was a while before I, I got a book of, you know, he has a couple of books that are have, you know, art and you, you know, they come with a CD also, of, you know, songs, but, uh, you know, it was a while before I got one of those and really looked at what he was doing overall. So, and he did the cover for Silverberg. Yeah. Yeah. How did you, how did you arrange that? Over the years, I'd gotten to know him first on Facebook and then in person. And, um, so asked the publisher, you know, that he would be willing to do the art if you're willing to, you know, pay him to do the art. And so that worked out. And it came together. That's great. Yeah. So you sort of alluded to this. You talked about how you, some things just kind of happen as you go. How much of a plan or outline did you start with? Not, not much. <laughs> and part of it, of, of this also, is that I had intended it or had visualized it as a novella because I was working on another novel. And then I had this idea. I thought, well, I can write it 
kind of quickly, I'll write this novella. And then I wrote the novella and gave it to some people to read. And one person thought that it was maybe only halfway finished. And I, I didn't like that answer, <laughs> um, but it turned out to be true. So I, I, I wrote the rest of it. And so in that case, I, I had more of a sense of that first part. And then I knew what was going to happen next once I got back to the writing. Um, and then after that, you know, it, it kind of fell into place after that. Because um, it basically, as we not give away too much, but, you know, the, it was ending, um, there's the poker game sort of thing. It ended before that. Um, I, I sense that you did a lot of research into poker. Yeah, I did. Um, and so I knew once I went back to it that the next thing that happened was this poker game. And so actually, I, in that case, I did have to do a lot of research and talking to people about poker before I could get to the writing. Did you, did you like show, have people read the parts that included poker? Poker is a, a critical part of the novel at one point. Um, did you have to like revise that some based on feedback? Yeah, yeah, I went through a lot of work. <laughs> I, so. I was trying to follow it. I'm not really a poker player and uh -huh. I didn't completely get it all, but I didn't really have to. Yeah. You know, yeah, it still it moves the plot. To know how much to put in, like to, to show the poker players that the right amount <laughs> That the right things are happening, but not to bore the non-poker players. And I don't know, you know, it, there'll be people who like and people who don't. You know, it worked for me. You know, so, so, so one aspect of this uh, at the very beginning. This this isn't really a spoiler because it comes at the beginning of the book that the the detective, the sort of like. 19th century detective is um, hired um, to try to figure out what's happened with some money that had been handed over to uh, supposedly buy, uh, I guess, a plot of land or a location for a bunch of Jewish immigrants who wanted to move there. And I was wondering if if that was based on something that was historically accurate, people getting rooked, you know, and deals like that. Mm. It, it probably is. No, I, I mean, that part I made up. Okay. I was just wondering if yeah. it was, if something that came up in your research. No, I mean, that part I made up, but then there's the little newspaper clip I have in there that did actually happen. I mean, it's from a, a, news story of that period where someone had embezzled money meant for Polish Jews and that. And um, that was the thing on early on, I'm, I'm flipping through, you know, people can say it's on page five. There was, you know, a little snippet from a newspaper. And so I had already made something up and then I found something from, that actually was in a newspaper two months after that part I wrote about um, that was basically the same thing or similar enough. So, so I took that as a validation that even though I yeah. made it up. And also I knew that not too long after that, there was something called the Galveston movement that involved. Um, I think the idea behind it was that most Jewish immigrants were coming through Ellis Island into New York and then stopping. And so there were, they were living in tenements, you know, there was overpopulation on the Lower East Side. And so the idea was to use Galveston as an entry port, but move people to other parts of the country. So find places where they could go, have money, et cetera. And yeah, you know, sort of a resettlement type of thing, but so that started happening in early 20th century. And yeah. so I knew about that and I felt like, 
whatever precursors would have been going on and it was uh, sounded like a reasonable thing for me to invent. Yeah, my great grandfather came to the US through Galveston. Mm -hmm. uh, he was Polish, he was a Polish draft dodger, I think, mm -hmm. avoiding conscription. Um, the, the, the Galveston does play a role in there. Uh, I don't want to talk too much about it because that's maybe kind of a spoiler, but um, did you ever live in Galveston yourself or just in Houston? Yeah, just Houston. But I assume you visited Galveston a bit. Mm, mostly just for the beach. You know? Yeah. So the actual city of Galveston, I don't really know at all. Um, it, it's interesting. I visited Galveston uh, about a year ago. And uh, it was like, it was unlike any other city in Texas, really. And there's a lot of history there that uh, is sort of unlike the history of the rest of the state. Yeah. And it's just stuff I didn't know about at all. I had no idea. I had no sense of what Galveston is about. And uh, I expect there's a few ghosts in Galveston. Yeah. You know, if there are any ghosts anywhere, there probably are a few there because uh, the hurricane was uh, um, one of the worst, one of the worst hurricane, worst hurricane disasters in this country, you know, especially then. But Indianola, you, you talk about Indianola in the yeah. book and Indianola never did recover. Yeah. Um, did you uh, spend much time investigating the history of Indianola? Yeah, yeah I read as much as I could. There, there's not a lot out there really for it, but I found some things. Apparently, no. th there were two hurricanes, and after the first one, they tried to come back and then uh, were hit by another hurricane, and yeah. they finally just kind of gave it up. And I. Yeah. I wonder, do you have any sense why Indianola never recovered and Galveston from all the hurricanes that it's seen has been able to sustain? No, I mean, it may have to do, I mean, geography, I guess, though, why Gal, you know, because Galveston is on a barrier island, basically, and Indianola was on the mainland protected by a barrier island or theoretically protected. So you would think it would have been less likely to be, you know, destroyed, but I don't know. And Galveston was maybe because it was farther north, closer to New Orleans and Houston, and you know, it was easier, an easier trade route, maybe, or just the people refused to leave. <laughs> so they just kept kept at it. You know, when I lived in Houston, I spent a lot of time in Galveston, and I noticed that they are, were uh, historically really into trying to find the the infrastructure that would protect them mm -hmm. going forward. Because I had a friend whose grandmother was actually in the Galvez Hotel during the 1900 uh, hurricane. That was one of the few structures that actually survived, or that was their family story. Yeah. There were a lot of things like that where people just, uh, it, it must be the culture of Galveston. They yeah. refused to give up. They kept building seawalls and jetties out there to try and protect. And there were a lot of places in Texas that didn't do that and they disappeared. Yeah. There's actually a good book about that storm, uh, Isaac's Storm, I think it yeah. is, uh, which I have not read. Uh, uh, but I'm, it's kind of in the queue. Yeah. Um, I mean, we have such a fascination with hurricanes. They're so incredibly destructive. We have one right now just off the coast and on its way here. Um, but the next thing I was wondering is, uh, so you, your, your other writing has been more contemporary. Are you interested now in writing, uh, more fiction that is set in the past, or do you think you're going to stay more contemporary in your writing? Or do you even know? I don't know. <laughs> Probably more contemporary. Um, I mean, that's what I'm doing now anyway. I mean, who knows what I'll do after that? Um, 
I mean, I have an idea to write something set in um, Eastern Europe in a like, you know, Jewish town of Eastern Europe, like probably Poland. Whether I uh, end up ever writing it, I don't know. But it just it was something I was reading, and I thought, you know, maybe I should write. You know, because that's where a big chunk of my family came from, and you know, it might be an interesting thing to research. But when would it be set? I don't know. Um, probably maybe the same time period as this, um, or maybe a hundred years before. I don't know, or I won't, or in the future. No. <laughs> now, now I, I don't know. It's just something, something I thought of, but that's a, a way farther down the line kind of thing. So, and right now my contemporary fiction tends to be set in slightly in the past. Like what I'm working on now is set in 1999 and it feels contemporary enough, I guess, to me. It's about Dick Cheney? Yeah, somewhat. He shows up in there. Is it political or... Is, does, is it just incidental that you have a political character in it? Um, I mean, it's political. I mean, everything is political, I guess. But Lately, especially. Yeah, um, you know, there, there's, you know, I guess. I mean, I'm taking something that the part of the right in this country likes to mythologize and giving them the actual ability to make it happen. Uh, except then it falls apart because, you know, because right-wing myths have to fall apart. Well, obviously, I mean, D Dick Cheney was one of their heroes. Yeah. And now uh, the Cheney family is in trouble with the yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it's kind of fascinating. Do you, yeah. Are you interested in writing about politics? I know, I, I'd say there's mm -hmm. not really any politics in, in Silverberg. No, not, not really. Except for skullhead politics, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> I think I would like to write a political novel. Yeah. Because I have such a distaste for politics. It just seems like something that I could um, sort of dismantle, you know? Yeah. It's like it's, it's kind of a, a madness. It's a delusional state as far as I'm concerned. So is there any more you can tell us about the book you're working on now, or would you rather keep mum about it until you're farther along? Yeah, I, I guess I guess that's about all I want to say. How much time do you spend writing? Um, mostly just mornings, you know, get up, drink coffee, you know, and uh, do some writing. Uh, then eat lunch and then move on to other things. I used to be fascinated reading about the right, the the lives of writers and mm -hmm. and how they. And actually, a lot of it was like that. I mean, there's seen there's there were writers I recall who would, you know, get up and drink coffee as you say, and they would maybe take a long walk, and then they would sit down to write. And who was it that had, was it Hemingway that had the thing with pencils where he sharpened a bunch of, a bunch of pencils to get yeah. started? I bet you don't write with pencils, do you? Are you no. Or did you say you write longhand for the first yeah. version? Right, longhand with fountain pen. So, but not pencil. Is there, is that kind of an aesthetic experience, just writing with a fountain pen versus? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it's... It it flows better, you know, and it doesn't it doesn't push into the paper the way a ballpoint does. So. I was a big fan of uh, I still am of Jack Kerouac, and his writing style was interesting. That he had uh, wire service uh, band fold paper that he would feed into his typewriter and just stop. He he would just keep typing mm -hmm. and not have to put in new pieces of paper, which is always. Yeah, a bit of a block whenever you were typing yeah you know, that's ancient technology now but uh, that was a big deal then and i was fascinated by that because i've worked in radio and so i started writing the same way because i had plenty of uh, fan fold uh, uh, teletype uh, paper and uh, and it really did uh, 
work at you know preventing uh, uh, losing your train of thought because that was something that would happen when I had to put out a new piece of paper mm -hmm. if I was writing something. It was newsprint, wasn't it? Big roll of newsprint. Yeah, it uh, it, it was uh, the teletype machines for Associated Press and UPI all came with big cases of fan fold paper, just endless paper that just, you know, folded. You did, a lot of people took to doing that when they found out Kerouac did it. You know, there were a lot of unusual practices among uh, the writers that were part of the so-called beat generation. Uh, there was also the thing of, uh, I guess it was William Burroughs and Brian Geisen would, uh, they would write a bunch of stuff and then cut it up and paste it together different ways. I guess maybe even toss it up in the air before they did that and create these kind of weird random hashes of, of text. Um, I've always kind of thought that was an interesting approach, but I couldn't figure out how there would be any sense to it, really. One of the great things about the Silverberg business is it just flows so well. Um, and as I said earlier, it's a page turner. I kept, it's one of those things where you just want to get back to the book and keep reading. Um, and you're kind of sorry when it ends. Uh, and now you're waiting, in my case, I'm waiting for the HBO miniseries. Yeah. And you probably are too. Yeah, sure. I think it would make a great, you know, miniseries, or I guess it could be a movie, a film, something like that. Uh, have you been approached for anything like that? Mm, no. <laughs> oh, we need to get the word out. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, I'm all for it. Um, well, tell me a little bit about, if you don't mind, I mean, if you don't mind talking a little bit about politics, what's, what's it kind of like politically where you're living now in Ohio? That's well, I mean, Yellow Springs is sort of Austin in like the the microcosm of Austin um, back when I lived there, which was I left at 95. You know, the old Austin where people argued and protested and you know were very left-leaning, let's say it's yes. sort of that's Yellow Springs, except much, much smaller. Um but it's you know surrounded by cornfields and uh, conservatives, so so locally, of course, you know the town you know has very liberal political views, et cetera. But the county government is much more conservative, and then and then this you know the cities in Ohio are less conservative. The rural, you know, just like Texas and everywhere, it's you know urban versus rural in a way as far as political situations. Yeah, there's been some talk of a potential civil war and it's kind of hard to figure out how that would work because yeah. you don't really have clear geographical boundaries for the right versus the left. It's all just sort of mixed together, but it does tend to be more rural versus urban. Yeah, And I guess the cities could build moats or something like that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or secede that could secede from the state yeah that's actually the, the most serious secessionist talk i've heard is when people talk about cities leaving states not states leaving you know the federation though I, there's been secession talk in texas obviously and i know there's a couple of other, other places where they've been talking about it what do you think about this sort of crazy crazy sort of political scene that we have in this country right now i don't know it's because it, it doesn't make any sense and so there's the thought that because it doesn't make sense it has to end soon and go back to some kind of normalcy but then it doesn't so i, I don't know how to predict that because like it's like Trump brought out all these things. 
So what makes them go away? You know, don't know. It could be that they just have a life cycle. Because yeah. I know we've been through stuff like this before. And those mm. people have always been there. The people yeah. who are a little bit nutty, uh, you know, uh, they've, they've been there, but they didn't really have a megaphone like they do now. They didn't really have a, uh, uh, a representative who was able to ascend to some position of power. And I guess the question now is what happens um, with those people, if Trump goes away, you know, do they just sort of calm down and go back to their lives or do they find another champion? Yeah. Well, there'll be people wanting to be their champions. So, yes. You know, yeah, there were similar things happening back to it when I was in high school and Barry Goldwater was running for president and he was bringing up a lot of the same causes, you know, the, uh, the, he was the first to talk about the silent majority and really trying to push the culture back to the good old days. And that seems to be a common theme again today. And I think the reason that it's become so widespread is today we have means of communication that didn't exist, you know, a couple of decades ago when it was, a, a similar political situation, but you didn't have a way of getting your message out easily unless you had an in at one of the three, you know, big TV networks. Well, you know, in the very early 90s, I was part of a thing called Fringeware, and we, uh, we gathered some steam as an organization with an email list and, you know, and one of the first companies to have uh, a real strong internet presence. And actually we wanted to sell stuff online. That was one of the things we were shooting for. Um, and we couldn't because uh, there was no way to secure credit card trans transactions when we were doing that. But one thing that we were talking about quite a bit then was how Everywhere in the U.S., there are people who sort of, in, I mean, in every little town, you'll have people who sort of think differently and are maybe a little bit weird compared to the rest of the people in their town. And those people, you know, they feel out of place. They don't have a way to connect with each other. And then the Internet comes along and suddenly they can find each other online. And uh, I think that is what's happened now, except it has a dark side to it that we did not, uh, that we didn't comprehend at the time. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of skull heads out there that are, <laughs> that are finding each other online now. And yeah. uh, um, who knows how that will go. Hmm. It's a mystery. Yeah. So the book that you're working on now, when do you think you'll finish it? Um, hard to say. Um, end of the, probably, I'd say spring. <laughs> probably. Um, and it's one that you were working on before and you sort of dropped for a while. Is that right? Yeah. Stopped, wrote the Silverberg business. Then I wrote a uh, middle grade novel, which is the kids book, sort of um, fifth, sixth, seventh grade level or fourth, fifth and sixth, somewhere around that. And that's something I'm still working on too. It's, it's finished, it's been through a couple of drafts but still needs more work. So um, sort of juggling the two of them right now, so. And, um, when you when you stopped to write the Silverberg business, did you think that you were just done and we're going to go and do something else? And then you decided to come back to it, or or did you know you would come back to it at some point? Yeah, I, I knew I would. I mean, that was the the idea. I mean, because then originally it was that Silverberg would be shorter, so I'd get back to it quicker. Then it took longer, and then I wrote another novel. So and then I went back to it. So, but I knew I'd get back to it. And I mean, it, it took a while, so I was worried that I wouldn't want to 
go back to it once I was ready to, but it, it, it was fine. It, it waited for me. <laughs> A long pause. Yeah. Uh, can edit those. Yeah. Do you ever read um, Bruce Sterling's um, The Artificial Kid? It was one of his early Many novels. years ago, yeah. I um, remember reading that when he was, for our listening audience, it was someone who had cameras connected to on little drones flying around him filming what he did, <laughs> which sounds awfully contemporary now. Oh, yeah. And something would happen or he'd say something and then he'd <laughs> think, um, that's okay, I can edit that out later. So... Yeah. Yeah, we do that. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah, Bruce, uh, Bruce, and I guess some of the other people who were classed as cyberpunk authors sort of had a premonition, you might say, uh, about cyberspace. I mean, the word cyberspace comes from William Gibson from Neuromancer. And uh, Gibson had been playing. Uh, he, just like arcade games uh, that kind of got him into, I mean, electronic games that got him into the thinking about the idea of uh, a sort of uh, uh, sense of space within uh, a technology mediated environment, a sort of virtual reality, um, which fed into Neuromancer, but there wasn't anything like that at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have the sense, I've always thought that the development of the technology was somewhat informed or shaped by some of the things that those guys were writing because the cyberpunk thing, the timing of it was kind of about right to influence people who were, who were actually developing what has become our like, personal computer framework and revolution that that we've seen over the last 30 years yeah it's been pretty interesting it it um it it's a little scary in a way because they weren't exactly envisioning a, a bright future no, no not really have you ever thought about writing cyberpunk or science fiction mm. No, I mean, I liked reading it. I just, I wasn't interested in it as something to write. Um, Have you read much of it? Yeah, I mean, not in a long time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, me too. I mean, the cyberpunk, I mean, I read that, but um, was more interested in, I guess, what connected, what I connected with more as far as writing was the J.G. Ballard's type of science fiction. Um, and more psychological, I guess, or, or something that... Uh, yeah, and it was and a bit more, surreal too. Yeah, yeah, he was really into surrealist art. And that, I connected with that more, I guess, uh, as far as what I wanted to write than uh, cyberpunk, et cetera. Yeah, I haven't read Ballard in years, there was one story of his that was published in Coevolution Quarterly that was about a, a, a sort of green, clean energy future. Uh, but I don't remember much about it. This is the problem is that years after you've read something, you've lost it entirely. Mm -hmm. And you have to read it again. And it's like you're reading a new book. Yeah. It's like wow, did I read that? In fact, things that I wrote years ago, I encountered, and I can't believe that I wrote them. Yeah, sometimes, Have you had that? It's interesting to uh, read something that you read a long time ago. You, I've had that happen recently. I, I read a book that uh, you know, had uh, been sitting untouched for decades i reread it and it, it had a total different meaning than i thought it had it may be that my memory had failed a lot of my memories have failed but 
I, I got a whole different perspective on the book and uh, you know, it was it was entertaining uh, again. You know, it's like I thought it would be boring to read the same book again, but it wasn't. Well, you know, the experience of reading a book is it's not just what the author's written, but it's also what you're taking from it. So you can read books multiple times and each time it's a different experience because you're bringing a different mindset to it. You know, you're in a different place when you're reading it. And uh, I've always thought that was kind of fascinating, really, that uh, uh, the reading of a book is never just the book. Mm. It's also what's happening in the mind of the reader. And I think it's important to uh, consider that. I've been very affected by books that I've read and even those books I've forgotten and probably need to go back and read again. And I know that if I read them again, it'll be an entirely different book. Yeah. I mean, it, it can be disappointing or it can be great, you know? You yeah. Just, don't know. Sometimes you feel like you're just going deeper and deeper into it. Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a Buddhist book actually called Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind that I've read many times by Shonyu Suzuki. And uh, it really is a different book every time I read it. You know, it's a very simple book. It's not, uh, it's not complicated at all. It's a short book, uh, but it's full of like Soto Zen wisdom and guidance. And uh, um, it's like looking into a mirror and seeing something different every time, which I guess is kind of the way we are too. We see ourselves differently from day to day. Yeah. Well, Robert, Thanks so much for joining us. This has been a great talk. Yeah, thanks for having me. You can follow the Plutopia News Network at Plutopia.io. On Facebook, go to at Plutopia News. On Twitter, it's at Plutopia. With John Lepkowski, I'm Scoop Sweeney. This is the Plutopia News Network, 20 minutes into the future. <laughs>